morning, everybody. How you guys doing? I'm really stoked for this new series that we've called Got Questions. Got Questions. In this series, what we're going to be looking at is four big questions that Jesus asked. Jesus asked a lot of questions. He actually asked, I was studying this, over 400 questions Jesus asked. He was asked 183 questions, but he only answered, check this out, he only answered three of them. He only answered three questions directly. Now, indirectly, you could, some studies say up to eight questions, like indirectly, if you want to get really, like, you know, tedious about it. But out of all the questions he was asked, he only answered three to eight questions. That was because Jesus was more than just a great answerer of questions. He was a great questioner. And it was actually part of his, like, rabbinical training of that time to become a rabbi. You didn't just learn all the answers to all the questions. What they actually learned is how to ask good questions. That's what was part of the training for rabbis, which makes sense because when Jesus, when he was young, you remember Joseph and Mary lost baby Jesus and he, they left him at the temple. You remember that? How in the world that happened? How do you lose Jesus? Come on, you guys. They lose Jesus and they go back to the temple to find him and they find him asking questions to the, to the teachers of the law. And it says that they were, they were amazed because of the questions that he was asking. And the reason why they were amazed is because he asked with such skill. It, took, it was a great skill to ask great, deep questions. So we're going to look at that. We're going to look at the four big questions, four of the big questions that Jesus asked. And here's the first one. This isn't in your notes or anything, which, by the way, we're getting back to notes. How many thank you for that? Come on, somebody. I'm ready. Let's give it. And if you don't have this, the binder, the sermon note binder, um, if you don't have one of those, and you, those are in the lobby at the information center. You can keep your notes inside that binder, okay? Study those throughout the week. Here's the first question that we're going to ask or that Jesus asked from us, and that is, do you understand what I have done for you? Do you understand? Now, Jesus, I love this question. Isn't this, do you, Jesus saying, do you understand what I've done for you? Now, the context of this question I wanna, is what I want to teach because this was in the experience of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. A lot of you are familiar with that passage. We're going to take a look at that again today. Let me set it up for you because uh, this was a very common experience of this day, this time. We don't have it. It's not common in our, obviously, we're not washing each other's feet and stuff like that. That's not what's, what, what we do, but it was common in their time. It was, it was so common that they would have a basin at, at the, the, by the table or by the area that they would eat. They would have a water basin for foot washing to be performed. And so every, I want you to picture this. Every one of the disciples, when they walked into this room, would have walked past the basin. Every one of them with their crusty, dirty, toe jam feet would have walked past the basin. And every one of them would have probably thought a similar thing. I'm not doing it. Not me. I'm a disciple of, I am. Do you know who I am? Every one of them passed the basin and sat down at that. At, again, I want to give you the picture of this, you guys. In those times, they had like three foot tall tables. They didn't sit at a table like we would sit at and like big chairs and a big table. Their tables were three feet off the ground, which is why in the Bible, when it says they reclined at the table, it's because they were literally, re, they were laying, that's how they eat. They would recline. I don't know why they did that. They're just like, we're going to take a nap after this anyway. Let's just go. This is easier position to do that. But, but this makes it more important to have a foot washer because when you recline at the table, your dirty feet are in somebody else's face and food. So they had this, and, in, and by the way, in this culture, a Jew wouldn't even do this role. It would have been a, a foreigner would perform this role because it was too low for a Jew to be touching someone else's feet and cleaning someone's feet. So Jesus, this is the scene, okay? All the disciples pass the basin. They pass it. And, G, and all just sit down. They all plop down and put their dirty old feet in front of each other. And Jesus is sitting down there and he's thinking, they missed it. Oh man, they missed it. And there's a teachable moment for Jesus. And he takes this opportunity to show them something. And I want to show it to you guys. It's in John chapter 13. You can look at it in your notes up here on the screen as well. It was just before the Passover festival. And Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Now that's important to note too, that, that this was towards the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. He knew it was time to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them, look at this, the full extent of his love. I love that. 
the, in the Greek, it means the full range of his love. That, that Jesus wanted to show them the, that the, the range of his love, the, that it went further than, than they thought. And it, it did more than what they thought. And sitting at the table, check this out, sitting at the table is Judas Iscariot, who would, who would betray him, hand him over to be beaten and killed. And a Peter, Peter was sitting at the table, who would deny Jesus just moments later, three times. And every one of those people that were sitting with him would, would just be cowardly and run out of fear away from Jesus. Every one of them. And he chooses, Jesus still chooses to serve them. The betrayer, Judas, the, the denier, Peter, the cowards, he says, no, they're still worthy to be served. I want you to see, I want you to see this picture. Jesus knows his hour is coming and who's at the table with him and he chooses still. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas. He was already the son of Simon Iscariot to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. I love that John put that in, the, in this gospel. Here, Jesus has so much power, all authority in heaven and on earth. He knew he came from God. And what does he do with the power? Oh man, I love this. I love that John puts this in here. That Jesus had all the power in the world to do whatever he decided in his heart, whatever he wanted to do. And what did he do with that power? What did he do with that authority? What did he do with that knowledge and that understanding that God had given him? He got up. That's what he did. He didn't stay seated at the table, reclined in his comfortable position. He got up from the meal. He allowed himself to be interrupted to serve some people. He took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And then it kind of, it goes on, you can read it, but he, he comes to Peter in the part that's not up here. He comes to Peter and Peter is like, no, Jesus, this is like a low of low. You can't, you can't do this to me. I'm not going to let you. And Jesus tells Peter, unless you let me wash you, you have no part with me. Unless you let me serve you, I need to show you something, Peter. You don't have any part with me. If you... And then Peter says, he says, well, then fine. Don't just wash my feet. Do the whole thing. Give me a bath, Jesus. Wash all of me. I want, I want it all. And then when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. And then he said, do you understand what I've done for you? Do you understand the meaning? Do you understand what this is that I've shown you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so. That's what I am. I want to remind you of that. He's saying, I am your Lord. I am your teacher. You're right. That's correct. But, but, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet, he says. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Now that you know these things, don't stop there. Can I get the screen that shows the actual scriptures that are coming up possibly? Now that you know these things, he says, don't stop there at knowing. Hey, don't stop at just knowing the word of God, at just knowing the good thing you should do. No, no. Because you'll be blessed if you what? If you do it. You'll be blessed if you, and God, Jesus could have done, I love the heart of Jesus. He could have just said, you idiots, this is what you're going to do because I said so. Who do you think you are? You know, he could have he went that route, but he didn't. He, he, he showed by example what they were supposed to do. And then on top of that, he put this, this blessing that if they were to do this, he, he didn't have to put a blessing attached to being a servant and serving others, but he did. This word right here is makarios. It literally, it translates to happy. He says, he says look, if you do this, it, not, you're going you're gonna to be changed on the inside of you. It's going it's to have an effect on the inside. It's going to make you happy. You're going to be full of joy if you do this. I think it's really interesting here, you guys, that all these disciples, they pass this basin and Jesus takes this teachable moment. And what, he, he's, what he's telling him is this, in essence. If the basin is beneath you, then the blessing is beyond you. If you want this blessing, hey, guys, when I called you to myself, when I said, come and follow me, I wasn't, 
I wasn't giving out titles, I was giving out towels. A lot of just before this moment, you can read it in Luke, Luke explains that they, they all passed up the basin and then they all started politicking together. They all started arguing who's going to be on the right hand, who's going to be on the left hand, who's going to be the greatest when he comes in his kingdom and he establishes his kingdom. That's what they were arguing about. Right there in the midst of Jesus passing the basin. And Jesus is going, man, when I called you to myself, I wasn't giving you a title. I was giving you a towel. That's, the blessing is in the towel, not the title. That's where the blessing is. That's where, that's where it is to be blessed is in the servant, in the heart of a servant. And Jesus wasn't instituting like, when he said, hey, I've been an example to you, do this. He wasn't saying, let's go wash each other's feet. Thank you, Jesus, right, somebody? Uh, which is, we do, there might be some foot washing ceremonies and maybe that are like, you know, um, moving and stuff, but he wasn't instituting a service. He was instituting a spirit. Amen, somebody? He was instituting not a service, not a foot washing service. What he was doing is instituting a foot washing spirit. He looked at his disciples past the basin and he said, man, you guys got the wrong spirit. You guys got the, you miss it. You guys got the wrong spirit. I want to talk to you today about the heart of a servant. That God has called us, Jesus has called us to have a heart of a servant. That when Jesus got up from that table and he took off his garment and wrapped a towel around his waist and took that basin, there was probably an audible gasp in the room. <gasps> the, the, what is happening right now? They were probably froze, paralyzed with just gasp. Jesus does the unthinkable and he's telling them, I, I've given you an example. I don't want you to do unto others as they've done unto you, which is what we like to do. We like to twist that scripture all around. Do unto others as they do unto you. Jesus, he's saying, look, no, no, I don't want you to do that. I want you to do unto others as I've done unto you. I want you to start taking your cues from me. All right. Don't respond to people in like kind or an opposite kind or, 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 or take your cues from the world. I want you to start looking to me and take your cue of how you're to treat people. I want you to treat them the way I treated them. I am your example. All right. Don't treat them the way that they treat you. You treat them the way I treated them. Jesus was elevating the standard of how we treat people. In this verse, do you understand what I've done for you? I've now elevated the standard of how you're to treat people. You're to have a heart of a servant. Now, when you look in the scriptures of, of our New Testament that we have, a lot of different translations that you guys read, a lot of the times it'll say servant, servant, servant in the New Testament. But the Greek word for servant, there's actually seven different Greek words for the one word servant in English. So it's very, I think, good and appropriate sometimes to go back to the original language your New Testament was written in, which is Greek, to get a little more understanding of what they're actually saying, of the definition of a servant and what a servant truly looks like. So I'm excited to get back to those notes. Let me give you the, I'm going to give you three, okay? Three Greek words for the one word servant we get, but there's three, there's seven of them. I'm going to give you three of them today. Three Greek words for servant in your New Testament. I'm going to show you where it's found as well. Here's the first one. The first word that we get is doulos. Doulos. And write it down. That means bond servant. Bond servant. I'm going to tell you what that means in just a moment. It comes out of Mark chapter 9, verse 35. It says, sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all, the doulos of all, he says. Now, what is a bond servant? Some of your translations translate it slave in a lot of translations, which is not a good, it's not a good word translation for us because it means something different in our in our culture and in where we stand in context of history as well. In the, in the biblical times, this bond servant was, a slave was actually someone who um, went under the employ of someone to pay off a debt. They got in over the head, they weren't able to pay it back, whatever it was, and so they went and served under an employer and they would work off their debt. But they had a law in this time that you could not serve or have a slave for longer than seven years. And after seven years, you'd have to set them free or a phenomena would happen and happen often where the, the slave would say, I don't want to leave. You treat me so good. I love you. I love you and I love your family. And I want, I want, I want to be with you for the rest of my life. I want to, this is what I want to do. And so he would voluntarily commit himself the rest of his life and become a doulos. 
he would become a bondservant. He would get a piercing on his ear and be considered part of the family now from this time. It's, it, so here's the principle. Being a servant is a lifetime commitment to serving. And I'm asking every one of us, church, every one of us, not just to commit to one day of serving. Don't make serving a Sunday deal. Don't make serving a serve day one day a year, which by the way, serve day is this Saturday. And I got, I'm not even going to, I'm going to tell you straight up what my goal is today, okay? I'm not even going to be coy about it. I want every single one of you at serve day. <laughs> not only that, I, I would love for every single one of you to figure out where, where can you serve others on a team. I do. I'm not, I'm not, gonna, I'm not even going to hide the fact that that's my goal here. You know why? Because there's a blessing attached to it. Amen. That God says, and this is, one thing is just know this, but you don't get blessed by knowing it, you get blessed by doing it. Amen. And I want to show you that today, that this heart of a servant, that the heart that a lot of us might have, the heart that this culture puts inside of us, the spirit that is inside of us isn't this foot washing spirit. And that's the spirit we need to have if you want the blessing of God. Amen. This is, it's this bond servant. I voluntarily give myself, not to just one day a year or one day out of the week, I give my life to you, Jesus, to serve you. He just loves it. God loves it when we do that. When we put as much of our, our time, our energy, our gifts, our resources, our money, or whatever into serving others and making a difference until we go be with Jesus in heaven. Amen. That's what it means. It's a lifetime commitment. Here's the second Greek word I want to give you. And, and this one here, diakonos, is probably the biggest contrast to what we think it is and what we kind of know it to be today than what it really is. Because diakonos translated is the word deacon. And so when we hear deacon, we think of like an elder in the church or maybe even a board of a church, depending on what your background or history is. Or maybe you think of the people that smoke in the back of the church. I don't even know. I don't know. But that's <laughs> Deacon is something entirely different than where, where it is religiously in culture today. Let me show it to you, and then I'll define it. It's in Matthew chapter 20. It says, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and that's the diakonos. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your, and there's the doulos word, must be your, your slave. The best English word for diakonos, get this, check this out, is waiter. Is waiter, like at a restaurant, waiter. He's, it's, it's a person who is just attentive to the needs around, that is, that is serving the needs and looking for the empty glasses and filling up the glass. Aren't you, isn't that, a, the, the, the measure of the, the good, if they're a good waiter or a good waitress to me, is if I start sucking down on the ice, you're too late, you're too late. You know, I'm, I'm about to take another bite, I need to wash it down. Okay, so they're attentive, right? They're attentive to the knees. They're filling the glasses up. And it's not, it's not waiting idly, by the way. A lot of us think this whole waiting thing, waiting on God, and those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. That would be a terrible waiter if all they did was wait. No, no, no. It's actually, it's, it's a different kind of waiting. It's, it's looking for the needs. It's while I'm waiting, I'm serving, I'm meeting needs. Here's the principle, that we focus on the needs of others. We're just focused on the needs of others. Well, what am I supposed to do on a Saturday, on a serve day? Here's, here, here's find, find an empty glass and fill it. Amen. That's what you're, you're to do. Here, here's how we say it at the Dream Center. We say, find a need and fill it. Find a hurt and heal it. Amen. That's what God has called us to do. So if you're going to come to the serve day this Saturday and we're, gonna, we're meeting down there at the Dream Center in the morning and on the way to serve day that you you pass by a car that is broken down with a flat tire, you just pass your serve day project. Right, right. That's, your, that's the basin right there. That's, that's the need to feel, that's the hurt to heal. Just be attentive to the empty glasses in your life. Just be attentive to the needs that are around you in your life. Hey guys, we're waiters. That's who we are, that's who God has called us to be. To be waiters, to be focused on the needs of others not the needs of our, ourselves. Here's the third Greek word I want to give you, and that is huporetes, huporetes. And, and that is translated an under rower, an under rower. And I'll tell you what that is. This is in Acts chapter 26 is where this is used. Paul is quoting Jesus here, telling, telling this a story to a king that Paul's kind of witnessing to. He says, now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you 
Jesus is telling Paul, to appoint you as a servant, as a huperetes, as an under rower, and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. So if you've ever seen these, like a, in, in movies like Ben-Hur, you ever watched Ben-Hur, that old one, or maybe even Troy or something like that, where we're in these big ships or these ships, there's, there's people in the galleys is what they call it, under the deck, and they're, and they're rowing, and sometimes they'll have like a, someone on, the, on a drum just to help them keep the beat of the, the, the row, and as they, they drum faster, they're rowing faster, they're rowing. So the, the boat is propelled. All the energy of, of movement of the boat is, is done by people who you can't see their faces, Okay? So it, it, they're, here, let me say it this way. They're completely anonymous. They're an under rower. So what's the principle of this then? The principle is, it's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about discovery. It's not about us. It's about making Jesus famous. The principle, write it down like this. Make, magnify Jesus, not me. That's what, the, that's what a servant does. A servant doesn't elevate self. It's not about us. That's why the Dream Center isn't called the Discovery Help Place. It's called the Dream Center Bakersfield, okay? Because it's not about discovery. It's not about any of us. A servant is someone who, not in your notes, but a servant is someone who makes a lifetime commitment to serve people's needs in such a way that magnifies Jesus, not me. And check it out, you guys. Jesus calls every single one of us to live this way. Every one of us are called to live with the heart of of a servant. And now what I want to share with you today is, is the four decisions that you and I have to make in order to live this life, in order to have the heart of a servant. And you, and, and you don't, listen, it's, you don't wait for a feeling. You don't wait for the Holy Spirit to move you. You don't wait for God to say something to you. You don't wait for, you, you don't wait for a stirring. No, no, you move. You are blessed when you don't just know this, but you do this, Okay. So here are the four decisions. Write them down. Here's the first one. That a servant puts service over status. A servant puts service over status. Again, the disciples were looking for titles, and Jesus was handing out towels. Okay? A servant is, it puts, the, puts service over the status. If, if serving is beneath you, listen to me, leadership is beyond you. Jesus was showing them a whole different, a whole different side of whether, do you understand what I've done for you guys? I need you to see something different, he's saying, because you're not called to, to be a leader like this world. In, in, the, the leaders of this world lord it over people, he'd say. They lord it over. But he, he, he said, not so with you. Not so with you. The first shall be last, the last shall be first. And Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve others. A true servant put service over status. And you know why this is so important? Because there is a gravitational pull inside of every single one of our hearts, every one of us, myself included, all of us here have a gravitational pull towards selfishness. All of us, all of us have this, we, we, we have our priorities, our goals, our agendas, our needs. We have this gravitational pull to meet our own needs towards selfishness and serving others is that antidote to it. And, and listen to me, one of the reasons why this is so important is because if you continue to serve only yourself, you eventually will be all by yourself. Right. This is one of the greatest relationship principles that, that Jesus would teach us. That I'm serious, if you could just get this heart of a servant, your relationships would be so much healthier. Your marriage would be so much healthier if you would have a heart of a servant. Instead of just looking to your needs being met, meeting their needs. Your, friend, your friendships would be healthier. Your career would be healthier if you just had a heart of a servant. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4 actually says that. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Don't do it because it's your, I want to do it this way, because I think it's, because my opinion, it's, it's, it's what I think is right. Rather, in humility, value others, check this out, above yourselves. One of the best decisions that you can make is that one right there, is to, is to, as a Christian, as a believer, is to see other people, the people in your life, to see them as above you. No, no, I don't see anyone, I don't put a pecking order because of how much I know or don't know, how educated I am, what position or title I am. No, everybody, I view them as above myself. 
not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. It's one of the best decisions that you can make. And if you want to know why this heart of the servant is so important, it's because God cannot fill you with his spirit if you are full of your spirit. Come on, somebody. God wants to fill you. God wants to fill you. He wants to bless you. But we're so full of ourselves. We're not emptied or we haven't emptied our cup for God to fill us up. A true servant, a servant needs to make this decision right here and put serving over status, over the titles, over your goals, over whatever pursuits, vain pursuits that we have. Here's the second decision. A servant puts character over comfort. Now, I don't like this very much. I know you don't probably like it very much in your life either, but God is more concerned with your character than he is your comfort. He's not. He's not concerned with it. I had a lady tell me, some of you guys have heard this. One lady told me one time years ago, she was wanting to leave her husband, and she told me this. Seriously, does, doesn't God want me to be happy? God wants me to be happy. And I told her, no, I don't know who told you that, but that's a lie from hell. God don't want you to be happy. He wants you to be holy. It's not, the, look, he wants you to be, he doesn't want you to be happy. He wants you to be blessed. And there is a difference. It's not the world kind of uh, happiness that happens since I do what I want to be happy. No, no, God is not interested in that. He's interested in your character in developing your character. And serving is very rarely convenient. When you have the heart of a servant, it's, it's very rare that, it just, that you serve others out of convenience. It's very often inconvenient. It's very often inconvenient. There's a story in the Bible in Luke chapter 10 that underscores the inconvenience it often is of having a heart of a servant. It says, there was once a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and on the way he was attacked by robbers. They took his clothes, beat him up, and went off leaving him half dead. But luckily, a priest was on his way down the same road. Oh, what's good luck, man. Here's a, a godly priest coming my way. I'm rescued. But when he saw him, he passed the basin. He passed the basin. He angled across the other side. But then a Levite, a religious man, showed up. And he also passed the basin. He avoided the injured man. And then a Samaritan, which in, in that day, this, the Samaritans were considered um, religiously unclean. They were, you wouldn't, a Jew wouldn't even carry a conversation with a Samaritan because they're unclean. They're, they, they, they were seen at despise. And here this man, who a Samaritan, traveling the road, came on him. When he saw the man's condition, here's what happened. His heart went out to him. And he gave him first aid, disinfecting and bandaging his wounds. Then he lifted him onto his donkey, led him to an inn, and made him comfortable. In the morning, he took out two silver, silver, silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take good care of them. If it costs any more, put it on my bill. I'll pay you on my way back. And then Jesus says, what do you think? Which of these three became a neighbor to the man attacked by robbers? Well, the one who treated him kindly, the religious scholar responded. So Jesus said, go and do the same. See, sometimes you have to bypass your plans in order to get to God's purpose. Amen. Serving is not, it's, it's not just about your action. It's also about your attitude. It's about your character, that God wants to do something in your heart. These priests, the priests and the Levite, they were asking the wrong question. And we're talking about in this series, this, like the great questions and the kind of questions that we ask and Jesus asked. These, the priests and the Levite, they asked the wrong question that got them to the wrong solution for this man. Here's the question that they asked themselves, something like this. If I stop and help this man, what's gonna happen to me? I may get beat up myself. I may, be, I may get taken advantage of. If I stop and help, uh, help this man, what's gonna happen to me? If you ask that question, you're never gonna get to the right answer, but here's the right question to ask. If I don't stop and help this man, what will happen to him? That's the right question. We empathize. We put our shoes in the place of the hurting. I mean, how in the world can we be 15 minutes away, church, 15 minutes away from hotels in our city that are enslaving and sex trafficking women and children, and we can just have our Sunday Christianity and say amen and go have lunch? We have 
to do something. Amen. We cannot leave that there. It cannot end here. God would beckon us. The heart of a servant would call us to more. But the problem is you'll never feel that way unless you see it. It's easier to feel it, to empathize when you see the need. The Samaritan was able, his heart was able to go out to him because he's been under persecution. He's been treated unfairly. He's been spit on and despised and treated differently and gone without. So his heart went out to him because he saw something different in his life than that religious person saw. But if you never see it, you'll never serve it. That's why it's so important. When I'm there at the Dream Center, I see the needs. When I'm knocking on doors on Union where there's sex trafficking and drug addiction and the kids are coming out and they just want to play. And they just want, hey, what you got in there for me? What else you got in there? You got that good stuff? And they're like taking all kinds of candy and stuff. I don't care. We're just loving on these kids. And the need that we see, the brokenness we see, the hurt that we see. You go on a mission trip and you see families living out of cardboard boxes and stuff. It just, look. I think differently, I live differently, I pray differently, I serve differently because I've seen it. And I want you to see it, church. I want you to see it. I want you to see the need because that need will move you to have a heart of a servant. Our hearts are changed when we serve. And that's why, God, that's why Jesus put this blessing on top of it because he wants you to be changed. He wants to change you from the inside out your heart has changed. Your heart of stone will become a heart of flesh. When you, when you see where the, outca- where, where the outcast sleeps, your heart of flesh or heart of stone will become a heart of flesh. Here's the third decision. Are you getting anything out of this, church? You guys getting something out of this? All right. Here's the third decision. A servant puts we over me. A servant puts... This, this here is the antidote to the thought that says, if you want a job done right, you got to... Yeah, no, you don't. If you want a job done right, do it with a team. Amen. That's if you want a job right, do it with other people. That's what you need to you need to change that, flip that, okay? Because this year, this thought, this attitude of, you know what, I got my own serving, I got my own charities, I got my own things that, that I do. I do my my thing. Okay, but that's not in the Bible. That's not what the Bible says to do. Do your own thing, your own way, on your own time, all alone. No. That's not biblical. Now, do you serve God or does he serve you? Who's following who here? Do you understand what I've done to you? I think Jesus is trying to tell us. Are you getting the picture? Acts chapter 2 says it this way. That all the believers were what? That's what God wants. Man, we can do so much more together than we can alone doing our own thing. All the believers were together and they had everything in common. And they sold property and possessions and gave to anyone who had need. Now, I've never been to the Middle East, but my giving goes there every week. And so does yours because we give together. Now, maybe you, you don't give to like disaster relief and stuff like that directly, but actually you do. You give to disaster relief uh, through your giving to Discovery because we give together. You guys see the picture here. You guys may not have given or going to ch- church plant and be a part of a church planting team, but your giving is actually helping plant churches all over this nation. Amen. Every week, every week, you, your giving, we can do more together than we can apart. Can I get an amen, church? Amen. So what do we do here? I mean, God has d- designed us to serve together, to give together, to change the world together. So if you want to, hey, if you want to change your marriage, you know what the answer is? Serve. Amen. You want to change your friendships? Serve. You want to know the meaning of life? Serve. You want to make a difference? Serve. You want to glorify Jesus? Serve. That's the answer. That's the answer. That's how we change the world. Here's the fourth decision. Let me give you the verse before I give you the last point because you guys start clicking your notebooks on me and stuff, okay? Because here's Matthew chapter 25, because one day, check it out, one day the Son of Man is going to come back. And I think it's sooner rather than later. I think we should be prepared at any moment, the Bible says, for his return. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate people one from another as a sheep separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and put the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, the sheep, come, you who are blessed by my father. You who are what? You who are blessed. You didn't just know it. You got the blessing because you did it. Come, 
All you are blessed by my Father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Well, what do we do? I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And then it confused the people. They said, the righteous will answer, the, those on the right will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and bite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And then the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers, my sisters, you know what he's saying? You, you actually were worshiping me. Amen. You want to know what real worship looks like? I mean, think, I'm so glad you came to church today. And I think God is excited you came. I'm excited you came. And we worship God and lifted our hands and lifted our mouth. But worship is, is, is so much more than that. I believe this true heart of worship just doesn't just sing. God, I think God is saying here, Jesus is saying here, if you want to worship me, love the people I love serve the people I served. What you, when you did it to them, hey, you were actually worshiping me when you did that. So here's the last, the heart of a servant right here. A true servant puts worship over wealth. God loves it. God loves it. When you prioritize your life, not just giving them a day of the year, a day of your week, but you put as much of your energy and your resources and your time and your talents and your treasures as you can to love those who God loves loves. Jesus says, do you understand what I've done for you? When I said, come and follow me, I didn't, I wasn't saying come and get all your needs met for the rest of your life. Come and, you know, I give you a title. No, I said, come and here's a towel. Come and be a waiter. Hey, this church, this is how we change the world. Through a heart of a servant. You don't change it any other way. This is the recipe of blessing that God has given us. The recipe of changing the world is when we can have a heart of a servant. We focus on the needs of others. We find a need to feel it. You find a hurt and heal it, and we'll change the world, church. Amen. Let's bow our head and close our eyes together. Let me just pray for you.